Join your host, Maddie Roche, as she brings you into a community of fee-only financial advisors who are successfully building profitable businesses that serve the next generation of clients. Learn from innovative advisors whose unique stories will inspire you to dream big and take action on your goals. Are you ready to live your best life and help your clients live theirs? Then you're in the right place. Hello, and welcome to this episode of XYPN Radio. I'm Maddie Roach, your host. I'm excited to have XYPN member Angie forbotten LaRossi, owner of Avea Financial Planning, a fee-only firm in Richland, Washington, on the show today. Angie has a unique experience entering the world of entrepreneurship. She's tried it more than once. In 2011, Angie pursued her CFP and opened up her own RIA, offering financial planning to those in need. However, after a few trying years, she closed it and didn't reopen her doors until 2018 when she found XYPN. Angie talks a lot about the challenges she and others are up against when starting a business, especially in those first few years. When Angie started her most recent RIA, she went deep into the college planning niche, but she has since pivoted and tells us why. Today, she serves women in the STEM industries, specifically those who work at the Hanford site, a major employer in her hometown. She relies heavily on the support of coaches, training, and her network to help her not only stay motivated, but to hone her message and her niche. Angie doesn't feel like she's met her full potential in terms of the impact that she can have on this world, and she cannot wait to continue to provide meaningful and lasting relationships to the women in her community. If you're interested in understanding how to pivot a niche, then this podcast is for you. Avocado toast, selfies, a mountain of student loan debt. Gen Y is anything but traditional, and with over 75 million people, it's a population you don't want to ignore. Learn more about how to serve this unique population in our guide called Attract and Profitably Serve Millennial Clients in Your RIA. Discover three key ways to tap into the millennial market and six things that they want from their financial advisor. Visit xyplanningnetwork.com slash millennials for your free copy. You can find any of the resources we mentioned during the episode at xyplanningnetwork.com slash 258. Also, be sure to go to xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP to join our private group just for XYPN radio listeners. It's a community of advisors we've all been looking for that's there to provide support when we need it the most. Best of all, it's free. I encourage you to check it out. Again, that's xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP. Without further ado, here's my interview with Angie. Hey, Angie. Welcome to XYPN radio. How are you? (laughs) I'm doing great. I am so excited to finally be here and be talking to you, Maddie. I know. I was so looked forward to this. There, there's so much to talk about today. I, I feel sometimes limited with, with the only having an hour uh, for our podcast, but I think we can we can put in a lot of good information today and, and certainly give you some credit for what you've done over these years. So um, I will let you do the honors, Angie, per usual. Go ahead and introduce your firm to our listeners. Where are you located? Who do you work with? How many clients? Okay. I am located in southeastern Washington State, the wonderful state of Washington. Awesome. (laughs) And uh, we call it the Tri-Cities. It's made up of three cities, Pasco, Kennewick, and Richland. So I'm right here in the bottom right corner. Uh, My firm name is Avea Financial Planning. And I've been in business since I called January 1, 2018, my start date. So it's just the end of two years now. For the first year and a half solid. I was really um, marketing and doing the niche thing towards families with college bound kids because that was me. That is me. I am a parent with two kids. My, my oldest is now in college. So we've uh, kind of gotten to that point, but I started back on with Joe's program um, back in 2017. I think I was part of his inaugural group with all of that. So um, just love the material, really spoke to me. I saw a lot of value and that type of thing, but I just really uh, did not find that there was demand because I was really marketing locally in my area. My area has about a population of roughly 300,000. So we're not close to Seattle. We're not close to Portland, not close to Vancouver or Spokane, which are the major areas around here. And I just uh, struggled. I struggled with that niche. So Since about, I want to say March or April of last year, I actually started uh, coaching with Brewer Consulting back in February, March uh, timeframe. 
And through that process, I changed my niche completely to a very specific employer part of our economy here in town. It's not just one employer. It's kind of hard to describe, but we call it the Hanford site. And what it is, is basically the Department of Energy runs um, a a nuclear uh, facility out there that goes all the way back to World War II, the Manhattan Project, the Cold War developing plutonium for the bombs. Now the mission is cleanup. And so they're not making plutonium anymore, thankfully. They're um, now having to clean up the messes of all of that plutonium creation. And so it's it's a huge project. It's funded by the Department of Energy. But the way I describe it is that we have uh, the DOE, they have major contractors, and then they have subcontractors, and then so on and so on. Wow. So even though it's not one employer, it, it all kind of ties together. People relate. I work at the Hanford site. That's kind of what you say. And so even deeper, however, <laughs> I made the choice to focus on women in STEM careers because that Hanford site employs women in STEM, scientists, engineers, educators, you know, that type of um, people. And so I've just systematically made the decision that I wanted to work and market toward women in STEM careers who work at Hanford. So wow. that's who I'm working for. <laughs> from, from one niche to another, what an incredible journey. And, and I'm looking forward to, to getting a little deeper on that. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll just get right to it. I'm interested in, in your decision to remain local versus kind of creating a virtual firm. We talked to a lot of members that uh, service clients uh, almost exclusively virtually. Yeah. And that, that's what they're proud of. Um, but then we've had other members on the podcast and other advisors talk about how they've really had a desire to do something a little bit more local. One of the reasons you mentioned for kind of moving away from the college planning was that the, the local market wasn't biting. Right. Um, what is your connection to the local market and why did you choose to remain somewhat local? So I'm from here. This is my hometown. Awesome. I actually live in the house I was raised in. Oh, wow. <laughs> this, this, this room is my brother's old room. <laughs> <laughs> what fun. It's, it's kind of funny. So, you know, whether or not that rings with people or not, but when they go to my website and if they've taken the time to read about me, you know, mm-hmm. and they, they realize that I am here, I'm here to stay. I think that wow. has some validity right there. Um, ironically though, back when I was getting started, my very first two clients were from the Bay area and they were college planning focused families. So that kind of kicked me off in, you know, that direction, but it was like all, all that and then nothing, you know, after that. So, and I, I really worked hard. I, Mm -hmm. I connected with the local high schools. I attended FAFSA nights. I, they have a big long college week here that all the colleges come to town for one week and they hit up all of our I don't know, nine high schools that we have here in town. And I had a booth, you know, and I passed out flyers and I got names and emails and things like that. And it just, it, I did classes. It just didn't go anywhere. So um, I think, you know, undoing that was tough. It was a tough decision because you invested a lot of time and energy mm-hmm. and all of that into that. But um, the local aspect, I just felt like that was more natural to me. Um, yeah. And we have, a, we have, especially by the niche that I've moved into, there's just plenty of opportunity, mm-hmm. definitely. And especially speaking to women, because I really feel like we may all say, if we talk about it, is we're underserved. And so yeah. um, I feel like I have plenty of opportunity just right here in my backyard. And I do like to meet with people in person. I mean, yeah. I, I offer virtual meetings and you know, now with the coronavirus and all that stuff, that's becoming a better option if that's what people want to do. But ultimately... I do like to meet people face to face and I think people here also appreciate the face to face part. So Absolutely. And I, I, I love the location niche. I, I think your credibility that this is a, a, a location that you have a lot of buy into and, and you've spent time in um, gives you a lot of credit in the eyes of clients, especially local ones. And I always think of Jennifer Harper, one of our original XYPN members, and, and her focus is on Chattanooga locals. And, and yeah. that really is very much a, a psychographic niche in a way that you've got to love where you live and you've got to love what you're doing there, uh, things like that. You mentioned Joe, Joe Messenger with yeah. Capstone College Planners. And right. uh, I know he and, and Dave have a really great program. And I'm wondering, at what point did you decide it was time to switch? Because we know some folks have a lot of success in the college planning area and others don't. I'm wondering, that mm-hmm. decision is not easy. Mm-hmm. 
I'm pretty sure I, I started to come to that conclusion around this time last year. Mm-hmm. But even last fall, which is when the high schools bring in the colleges, I still attended the college fair and spent a whole week. I mean, mm-hmm. literally morning to night at five days a week at the area high school. So I still kind of gave it one last push <laughs> and and I hosted a two night event through my community education and got absolutely no turnout, you know, mm. and it was just, I was kind of the, the nail in the coffin, so to yeah. speak. So um, yeah, it was tough. And by then, by then I had been into Brewer, you know, consulting a few months. And so I was really convicted to my new path. And, and now um, I was just listening to Meg Bar- Bartelt's, one of her, I think her last podcast, actually, I was listening to that recently. And she talked about, uh, it took her time to find her own voice. And mm. I think that's where I'm at right now is I'm, I'm really excited about this new direction. And it's already resonating with me. I've had several prospects and I've already had several people comment your website speaks to me because I've been working on it about the last two months, just changing the language, adding a little bit of photos and just, just the language primarily. And they honestly are saying it speaks to me. I feel like you're talking to me and like, how awesome is that? I hadn't had that before. So um, it is confirmation that I feel like what I'm doing is going to be just fine because what I've been doing has not been just fine. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. What a good feeling to, yeah. to feel that. Uh, yes, I'm optimistic. And, and, yeah, and to be told that by people, that, that it is working. Um, I'm wondering, the name of your firm, Avea, what a beautiful name. What what uh, connection does it have, or, or where did it come from? From, you know, looking online. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know that it has a meaning, to tell you the truth. It has, yeah. It's. I think it's got some Latin-based uh, okay. parts, like bird or mm-hmm. something. But I have to make up a story because I get this asked a lot. And it's like, I don't have an answer for that So because there really isn't. I just kind of wanted a short name that started yeah. with A. Beautiful. <laughs> and awesome. that's what I found. Yeah. Uh, so let's take a, a walk through memory lane a bit and, and go back to kind of when your, your professional career started. Um, go ahead and tell the listeners of, about what, what you were doing post-college and, and if you, you know, even in college, were you focused on financial planning? I'm, I'm interested in, in all the good details. Okay. Yeah. College, no, no financial planning at all. I was a international studies major, really uh, spent my junior year in France, you know, studied French for five years, that kind of thing. Right after college, got a job. And again, this was 1990. So and I look back, I, I don't remember what the economy was doing, but I look back and apparently it was a bit of a recession. And so I didn't remember that or didn't necessarily feel that, but I do remember not having much for interviews on campus during that time. So I got two interviews. Uh, the first interview was with a company to um, bring teachers to Japan to teach English. And the second one was Lady Foot Locker for a manager position. Wow. And I got, I got both jobs. <laughs> two out of two. So I chose the, the job in Japan because it really fit more with my overall hopes and goals, you know, living internationally, you know, having some kind of international business career and so on. So that took me there for a year. It was a year contract and I taught English in a particular school there. But then that evolved into more jobs, and I ended up actually picking up a, a husband over there. I call him my souvenir husband. He's not my current husband. <laughs> but, you know, so that kept me there five years. So I was there for five wow. years. Yeah. And, um, you know, right after that, then we came back to America. Um, our marriage wasn't overly strong, so it didn't, it didn't last that long. But I moved back to the Tri-Cities, hmm. and my sister had a great idea. Oh, <laughs> I had money burning a hole in my pocket because I had made good income when I was living in Japan. Uh, she wanted to open a beer store. And so <laughs> this is wow. the beginning of the microbrews, you know, Seattle microbrew scene and all that. And sure. Okay, sis. <laughs> She's the older sister. Yeah. I went along with the ride and I had $30,000, you know, in my pocket, literally from just leaving Japan and having had savings and having split my half with my former wow. husband. So um, we opened a beer store, and that was my my very first foray into business. My big takeaway from that: we were open for just three years, and that was the lease agreement. <laughs> okay. Be, uh, but my big takeaway from that period was overhead kills you if you you know mm. if you can't afford your overhead, it, it's really tough. And our overhead was super high because of the location that we had. So 
that's been a big takeaway with going forward with this business for sure. Um, I'm going to fast forward through a couple of things. I did have a little part-time job with MetLife. I met a person there, actually the MetLife guy who hired me, uh, ultimately hired me 12, 13 years ago now to be like an assistant in his new RIA, his new fee-only RIA here in town. And he partnered with another advisor. So they hired me and it was the three of us that launched their business and they're still going today. Um, That's the business that I left in 2017 because um, I guess I would describe it. I, I was also a failed succession plan story. So in 2011, I got my CFP. And because I was somewhat that disgruntled employee, not horribly, I did. I mm-hmm. love my two bosses and I love being there. And I, I was actually there yesterday, oh. borrowing some software to do something. So we have a great relationship still today, which is awesome. But um, I just felt like I needed to spread my own wings. And I started my own RIA in 2011. Wow. All by myself. All by myself. Without you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. We were not even a thought then. Um, I know. So Angie, uh, what gave you the courage? What, what, where did you get the idea that going out on your own was what you could do? Well, I kind of always took care of the compliance where I worked. You know, I was, um, I met I met Sergio. Sergio is still on my speed dial on my phone today back in 2007 when he came to give us our technical visit back then when we were brand new. And I took care of the ADV updates and all of that every year. So uh, really, that's that's all you need for you know, getting stuff going. You need a bank account. You need a business name, you know, stuff like that. I didn't even have a business name. I was a sole proprietor for that first round. And um I just did it. It took forever because I just didn't know what I was doing or how I should have approached mm-hmm. it. But I just, you know, you call people, you get questions answered and you just do it. So um, it was definitely doable. And I describe it though, because I was only working part-time for those those two bosses of mine. And so I technically had half a day to myself that I could pursue this. And I, I did. I, you know, I don't know if I shared this with you before, but basically I literally put a classified ad. We had a special part of the classified section in our local newspaper called the services directory. And it was meant for professionals, you know, so lawn care, tree trimmers, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, financial advisors, you know, you name it. And once in a while, I'd stick my little picture in there as well. And it was probably, 50, no, it was a couple hundred bucks a month. But that stupid little ad brought me in some really great clients even back then. So um, you just never know (laughs) where to find people. I think what brought them in though, is the fact that I was just doing planning at the time. I did not do investments at all. Mm. And, um, and they just wanted advice because most of these people were pre-retirees. They just wanted kind of that, that extra set of eyes that what they were thinking and doing was going to be okay. And they could go ahead and retire. So Mm. um, it was a great experience. It really was. It did help me also get more confident and what I could do or couldn't do. And, you know, I didn't need my, my bosses to help me through everything. I did it all by myself. So yeah, it was a big, a big confidence booster for sure. Oh, I would, I would totally imagine Mm -hmm. it being that way. Were your bosses uh, supportive of you kind of starting the side hustle? Yeah. I mean, I had to tell them obviously, and we had to update the ADV Mm -hmm. to reflect that. And, um, I'm pretty sure they just figured what what's she doing, <laughs> thing, you know? Yeah. Go go have fun, go do your thing, and I did, you know. But ultimately, what ended up happening is they departnered, mm-hmm. and I went full time for about two years, I think it was. And then at that point was when I started to get benefits, and I I got my first four hundred one k, you know, because I had only been part time up till to then. So, um, it was just it was time to shut down that first RIA, go full time, kind of continue to, you know, take care of the kids and things because my kids were in middle school about that time. And I was really just planning my next move. Mm-hmm. I knew I, I knew I was going to do this again. I just didn't know when. Yeah, I knew I was going to do this again. So that's why I was so happy to find XY. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So when did you decide to close that RIA? 14. 2014. And do you recall how many clients you were serving at that point? Um, you know, I did look back at one time. I don't have that right in front of me, but I want to say it actually kind of mirrored 
what I have experienced this time around too, uh, at least revenue wise. I can't remember the number of a client of uh, number of clients I have, but revenue wise was again kind of the struggling first two years, right? Mm-hmm. And um, it was very very close to that. So uh, numbers of clients, I'm not sure, but also ironically, I touched out uh, touch base with many of those people. Um, couple years ago, I want to say, and I have one of those clients from back then is a client today and they're Ah. retired. You know, they weren't retired back then. Now they're retired and they're doing fine and they're great. You know, I love them. They teach me stuff. They share stuff with me. (laughs) Oh, that, that is so cool. Um, so let's talk about that first year in business. Fast forward to to January of 2018 when Mm -hmm. Avail was, was becoming your second RIA, um, what was that first year like? It, it was very uh, unfocused, mm. I would say. And, you know, now having gone through two full years, it's clearer to me when I'm looking back at maybe what I could have done differently. And I would say, at first of all, I think I just didn't know still what to do or how to do it. Mm. You know, just still figuring that stuff out even though I had done it before, but, you know, gosh, 2011, honestly, that was almost pre, not pre-internet, but yeah, pre-social media. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of LinkedIn and things like that going on back then that I can recall, or at least I didn't take advantage of any of that. Um, but I, I just felt like I was lost. I just mm. did not know what I should be doing with every minute of my day or what, what activities should I be doing day after day to mm. generate clients, basically. So. Uh, just very, very unfocused. And I, I feel like I got kind of pulled away from even trying to focus on those things by other activities that were fun. So I, I have a podcast, right? And the podcast is fun. That, <laughs> that was my very first project. I actually started on that, I want to say, before I even got registered, you know? So um, again, Meg, Meg is part of, uh, she helped mentor us about a year ago, right? And she mm-hmm. was doing that for a small group of, uh, group of us. And I remember her saying either to me personally or on the Facebook post or something about maybe your first thing shouldn't be putting out a podcast. Maybe you should go get clients first, you know? No, yeah, no. No, I know. <laughs> no, no. But I think it was just something I, I felt I could figure out how to do and I, I didn't, hadn't figured out how to go get clients. And so- um, that looking back, that was a mistake. I, I think that that's a really good point though. And, and I don't know if you necessarily have to qualify it as a mistake. I mean, I think in hindsight, you, you definitely have different perspective, but I, I want to give you some credit for, for chasing after things that you want to do. I mean, I, I think what, what differentiates a lot of XY advisors from other advisors is just this inherent drive that they have both to help and provide, um, but also to have their voice heard and to showcase mm-hmm. their expertise. And like you said, do something you knew how to do and you were good at. And, and I, I there's no shame in that, especially while you're in that first year of twiddling your thumbs, waiting for those clients. But I, I could see yeah. that in hindsight, especially having been in your, your first year for the second time that, that you wanted to have maybe approached it differently. So I guess talk to the listeners about how you would have approached that first year differently. Well, I think my mindset too was that this is a marketing tool. This mm-hmm. was going to be a marketing tool. And, and I think it is to some degree, but I don't think it it was to what you had thought it was going to be. Mm. So uh, if you're going to spend that kind of time and energy on marketing, it could have been spent elsewhere is what mm-hmm. I would have said. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually didn't know how to do a podcast, but what oh. n- another kind of distraction that I let myself have was I, you know, and people touch on this when they talk to X, Y in the podcast or on kids' podcast about mm-hmm. we're a helping profession. We like to help, right? And I feel like I'm kind of guilty of that too. And so I I was looking to help uh, my kids' high school. They have an internship program for the Mm -hmm. seniors. And so I thought, what a great idea. I'll get a high school intern for a few hours a week, and they can help me put this podcast on. So I was actually killing two birds with one stone. I was Mm -hmm. helping a student get some work experience, and I was helping myself get this podcast off the ground. But it really, you know, um, and I did that for two years. I had had two students help me. Wow. I don't have one anymore because I've, you know, I'm trying to come at this with a much more business focused or business based decision making. And 
as fun as that was, as good as it was, as helpful as they were, um, it took a lot of time mm-hmm. away from more other um, business building activities. And so I just had to stop that. I'm still doing the podcast. I'm, okay. I'm actually behind on podcasts right now, <laughs> but uh, I don't have the interns doing that for me anymore. And I'll either just do it myself or I'm going to find somebody to help me get those out. So I do like the interview part. And it, the other thing that I think it does for me is it opens the doors because I am local. I, I can go here somewhere in town and I want to talk to somebody who's significant by golly, they get pretty excited if you ask them to come on your podcast, you know? Mm -hmm. So it can open doors as well. So yeah. Talk to us about how you did keep busy during that first year outside of the podcast. Um, It, as a solopreneur, you're often kind of finding yourselves in your extra second bedroom waiting uh, for, for the clients to fall out of the sky. Um, What did you do? How'd you stay busy? Hmm. Let's see. What did I do? I, I worked out of a co-working space that mm. first year, first to year to two, yeah, part of mm-hmm. second year too. And I, I've actually dialed back from that as well, just to cut costs. But um, I think I am, you know, just networking. I did a lot of networking. Um, I've done quite a lot of coaching off and on over the last couple of years as well. You just, you do things that seem so important at the time and, you know, maybe they were, maybe they weren't, but mm-hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, the college stuff too, you know, trying to network and talk to and meet with high school counselors, doing some of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned that it was a hard first year. Mm -hmm. uh, And I'm wondering, are you interested or or open to sharing kind of the client numbers that you had by the end of the first year and just give some perspective and maybe let know if you have it? Yeah. So um, I would say I'm like almost everybody else where you Mm -hmm. undercharge (laughs) that first year. (laughs) And I probably should have put what did I charge each of these, but the first year I had six clients. Okay. And they're mostly short term one off type things. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna say I can tell you for certain that a few of those were at seven hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. You know, just sort of a little a little plan. Mm-hmm. And I had one ongoing client that had assets to be managed. Okay. And um my revenue for that year was just under five. Okay. Great. Yeah, or just right at five, basically. Mm-hmm. So uh, then my second year, which is 2019, I had 11 clients, and I would say that four of them were more that shorter term or one-off type client, and seven were ongoing. Okay. And ongoing to me, I guess uh, my my services have changed actually uh, from 19 to 20. So what would have been an ongoing client would have meant a 12-month engagement client, hoping that they would renew and continue on. They may or may not have had assets with me. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a different definition going forward in 2020 because I've just modified my service from 12 months to six. And people who do six months, I won't have assets for. It's Mm -hmm. just, it's more like a one-time plan, but it's spread out over six months. Yeah. And so then as of today, I have 10 clients and five of those will be potentially ongoing. You know, they could mm-hmm. convert, but they're not technically at this point. And then five investment management ongoing type clients. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I, yeah. I love people um, being open about that stuff. It just gives our listeners so much more perspective. It does. My, my, my question for you is, is how did you deal with, with the lack of income in that first year? I know that that's a big concern for a lot of our, our advisors starting out is, um, you know, we, we really encourage them to have a lot of money in the bank to be able to get through the first, not just one, two, mm-hmm. but even third year yeah. um, as, as they're building their base, possibly pivoting niches like you did, service offer and so forth. Um, how did you make up for that income loss? So I've done a variety of things. I have pulled a small amount from my Roth IRA okay. that I have. I'm happy to say it's only about maybe 13000 It wasn't a huge amount. Great. And because that just killed me. Mm-hmm. I know, I bet as a planner. <laughs> yeah, it just killed me. Uh, I've, um, I've used credit cards. Okay. I have stuff on credit cards, which also just kills me because mm-hmm. that's just not something we've ever done before. Um, luckily, we have a rental house, so that nice. in some ways replaced my paid income from my prior job, but we had that income <laughs> when I had my prior job too, so it didn't really replace anything, but it's still there. Yep. 
And luckily, we've had rising rents in this area, so it went up mm. <laughs> this <Go> last <laughs> year. So it's really helping right now to say that for sure. So, yeah. um, and then of course, you know, I'm married, so I I have my husband is the primary uh, earner right now, mm-hmm. and so my you know my goal is to stop that this year. That's just got to come to an end. So um, that's kind of how we managed it. I yeah. did not ha- I did not have a bunch of savings like, beside the retirement Roth account because we had saved money to go on a family vacation <laughs> right before I launched this business. So again, that was intentional. I mean, we saved for several years to do that. And it was a very important goal, family goal, because I have kids who will be out of the house and, you know, they they're have summer jobs and things like that. So there wasn't going to be another opportunity perhaps to have the kids out of the house. And we traveled for a month to wow. around Europe. So it was a big deal. And we spent all that cash, you know, mm-hmm. on that goal, which was mm-hmm. just fine. So aside from that, I didn't have a bunch of cash sitting in the bank. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd love to talk to you about your why. And I, I love that you say that, that we're in a helping profession. I, I just feel that so much. Um, all of our XYPN members are, are so giving in, in terms of uh, embracing the abundance mentality and sharing what they've got. But what is your why? Have you ever sat and really kind of tried to define that? Why, why have you given this two awesome tries at, at running your own firm? I think I have a few different whys and some are altruistic and some are more (laughs) selfish, you know, really. Um, I've, I've felt like I just haven't met my potential, my own potential. And so this is another challenge to me to have that level of success that I think I am, I'm, I'm, I should be able to obtain. And so that's Mm. one, that's the selfish one. I love Um, that. But this is why I also changed my niche to what I'm working toward is because, you know, the more I talk to women and it, it does happen, and this is a, a great argument to get out of your house, get out of your office and go talk to people because the more I do that, the more I really feel convicted that women need my help. Mm. Women need my help. Everybody needs help without a doubt to some degree, but I really feel pretty, pretty passionate about women needing my help. And stuff just always comes up. I was just at a, we have a local little meetup on Thursday mornings at the coffee shop and sat next to a woman who I believe is around 62. And we were talking about this and, and she didn't know what I did. And so we're just kind of talking about this and wow. she leaves everything to her husband, you know, and I, I get it. I do. I totally get it. But I just wanted to, you know, come talk with me more. Let's, let's talk about this. What happens if something happens to him? How are you going to handle that? Or Mm -hmm. does he know your opinions on things or, or does he take your um, risk tolerance into mind? Or do you talk about this? Do you have monthly planning meetings? How do you guys manage this? And she just was really checked out of that whole part of her life. And that bothers me, you know, and I, I know that's a, a bit of a, um, what do you call it? I guess a, a bit of a age thing, perhaps, mm-hmm, you know, the mm-hmm. older generation and I'm, I'm mid-century modern. So I, I'm getting to the, <laughs> <laughs> you know, generational thing too. And I think it, it rings true for women of my, even my generation that we are not always so clued into our own financial lives. Mm. And so, um, I don't begrudge her that opinion or, or the way that they've mm-hmm. got it structured now, but it, it, it's just something to work toward to help women take greater control of their financial lives. So that that's another one of my whys. Great. Have you ever written a mission statement for your firm? Probably somewhere, sometime. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have it on my wall, so yeah. <laughs> it's not recent. I, I ask because at XYPN, we we practice the, the entrepreneurial operating system, the, mm-hmm. the EOS model. And, yeah. and one of the first things is really getting clear on mission. And I, it, as you went through your whys, um, I could kind of formulate a, a, a mission statement. I'm wondering who of our members have actually created one and, and really stick to it. Um, I, I love this idea that women need your help. I, I agree that that women as as an entire population have been underserved and kind of underrepresented in this industry. And it's it's been a theme on this podcast for a while. Um, how are you feeling like your services are being conveyed to your potential clients? Are, are you feeling and sensing that they're a bit more in a phase of their lives where they can start taking control of their finances? I do. Yeah. And, and that's kind of where this new niche 
And, um, you know, I'm primarily using LinkedIn for connecting with people who are employed at the Hanford site because cool. they're identifiable. I can, I can find them and identify mm-hmm. them by the companies that they work for and connect with them. <clears throat> and so when they contact me and when we have both either, I, I now do a two-step initial prospect mating. Mm-hmm. And the first one is, is more light duty. They're just kind of telling me what's on their minds, what caused them to reach out to me and so on. And then this, if they're willing to go to the second meeting, that's where I've collected more information. And we just, we just do a little more qualitative questions, a little more quantitative questions. And it's really amazing what can come out in those meetings. You know, as far as I have one just the other day where I wouldn't call her an ideal client because uh, she's not, she would be this six month period type program, but she's got, uh, I forget, thirty or $40,000 credit card debt and makes, you know, income in the range of 105 or 110,000 a year. She's, she's very well paid. Um, but she just doesn't know how to manage that. Doesn't know how to say no. Cause she helps out adult children. Mm. Um, and she, her own, in her own words, she said, I feel ashamed and oh. she was in tears. And so, you know, that, that's a problem (laughs) for somebody. And I'm like, you know what? You're not ideal client necessarily for me, but I can help you. I can help you. Mm. And I don't know who else could help her really. Mm -hmm. I know there's debt, the debt counseling type folks and things like that. But, um, you know, I just feel pretty strongly when you hear stuff like that, it's like, yeah, you bet I can help you. I'd love to work with you. So yeah, it's just, it does. It's just kind of, it comes out like in times you can't even hardly understand what they're saying because it just doesn't I'm so in this you know this is my world but it's not everybody else's world for sure Mm -hmm. what is it about this relationship dynamic of the advisor and client that becomes so transformative I think it's just so it's so intimate Mm -hmm. it really is and we we go deep you know, I try to go deep and I, I feel like that is a bit of a differentiator. I hope to increase my skills and abilities in that area too, as I, as I progress in this career, um, because I just feel like money is so much more than just buying stuff or even retiring. It, you know, we know that there's that behavioral side and that emotional side. And when I've even, you know, Again, I, I start with the kinder questions. Once people are clients of mine, I do start with the qu- kinder questions. I've been doing that since my first time, 2011. Wow. Yeah. And I have never gone through kinder. And so I see myself doing that down the road because it, it just so, it so resonates with mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. And I have multiple times, typically couples will have even the husband in tears because he's going through the questions and it there's something in there at some point that just kind of gets their heart and they're in tears. And it's, I'm certain that was not expected. I'm certain when they came in thinking they're going to start doing financial planning, that they were going to be in tears Mm. in front of their wives and a strange woman and talking about money and, and at why it means so much to them. So it's very intimate. It's a very intimate relationship. Yeah, it, it, it really is. And I, I think, as, as a lot of XYP and advisors are, are focusing on the younger generation, the, the younger generation, I think, is a bit more vulnerable in that regard and that they're, they're okay kind of taking off their, their money clothes in front of people a bit. And, and whereas, you know, when I, I tried to talk to my 67-year-old mom about, you know, and, and my 65-year-old father about getting a financial planner, they're like, well, I don't want them to see how much we spend on this and that and, you know, what the wine budget is and things like that. But um, I I think younger folks are are actually coming into this a bit more with, with knowing that, that money and and owning the relationship with money could be transformative in their lives and and thus maybe possibly more open to these kind of relationships. But those kinder Mm -hmm. questions, I agree, really get to the heart of it. Once once you do those three questions with your clients, what does the relationship typically typically look like, or what is your ideal relationship with your client? Well, so that that is literally our very first meeting, mm-hmm. and typically people will either have already uploaded and and scanned documents to me, 
maybe not, maybe they'll bring them in person. <clears throat> that meeting is always in person unless they're not living here locally. Mm. Um, and so it just starts there. Um, and then I, I like to try to review the documents if I have them with me. If not, that first meeting is really just about getting to know you and getting to getting some sense of what's important to you. What would you like to try to achieve um, with this planning process? Beautiful. And then you didn't choose to offer investment management during your first try at the RIA space. Correct. Why didn't you and what prompted you to offer it now? I think because I had the job. I was still employed for somebody else. And I think that was sort of our arrangement with my boss is that um, if somebody came to me and they said, yeah, I have a million bucks, <laughs> which I do with it, manage it for me, I would have referred them to my my other self at my other job. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, so I, did, I just didn't think it would have been, I guess, a good idea for us yeah. at that time. Yeah. Okay. You've mentioned a few different groups that you've been part of and, and programs that you you've gone through. I, I can just sense that you're kind of this like never ending learner, like, <laughs> like many of the XYPN members, would you mind talking to the, the audience a bit about some of the continuing education programs that you're involved in kind of your evolution through different coaching programs and, and why you believe that investing in those things can help you and your firm? Oh Yeah. You know, so a lot of times financial planners don't have their own financial planner, and I actually don't. I don't have a financial planner either. But if I did, it's Alyssa, Alyssa Lum. Hey, Alyssa. She, she'd be my girl. <laughs> um, and yet I, I hire other professionals mm-hmm. to help me in other parts of my life. So the coaching XY mm-hmm. is definitely a really important part of this because of the plethora of mm-hmm. opportunities that you provide for education or marketing coaching or sales coaching, whatever that looks like. So there's a lot of tools there and it's almost, you you almost have to stop and reconnect with X, Y, and say, okay, it's been six months or it's been eight months or a year. Am I taking advantage of everything? What have I missed? What should I be looking at? So there's always stuff there with X, Y, for sure. Um, I started with Brewer last year about mm, March. I think it was at the beginning of March. And even though, in my opinion, it was, it was an investment, it was expensive to me, um, I feel like I got a lot out of it, and particularly the niche decision and the how to reach those people, uh, particularly l- using LinkedIn in trying to yeah. connect with those people, uh, among other things as well, um, and using more video, using more online content, that type of thing through LinkedIn. So um, big shout out to them. I am wrapping up my time with them because I feel like I've taken what I can. Mm. And now I just need to really kind of spend more time implementing and doing, 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 doing. Really. Yep. So that was great. Um, I actually started another different coaching program. I'm just starting that. We had a speaker come to town and she focuses on non-financial advisors. It's not our industry specific, but it's basically She's that business-minded person that I wish I had had two years ago to look at the numbers, to see what's driving things, to see what activities are you doing, uh, what's your attitude and your emotion, what's going on to driving that business fast, faster. Wow. You know, six, it's called six figure something or another. And you know, I, this is what I feel like I'm needing at this point in my career is the kick in the butt. So I know what I need to do. I know who I'm doing it for. Now I just need the kick in the butt to keep keep doing and to do, do, do. <laughs> so um, let's see what else. And then I I think uh, it was XY that put us together with Meg and a few other mm-hmm. of the XY members just into a, a mentoring program. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And lucky Meg, you know, she's awesome. So she got a bunch of us and it was great. You know, it's just yeah. picking her brain and our... our our collective brains, everybody was at different places in their careers, but they were relatively new to their businesses and to the XY planning network. So just, um, I do find that I respond well to coaching. I just, I don't like being alone. I don't like working alone. And this has been a big challenge for me. Yeah. Being a solopreneur here. So <clears throat> that's something that I thought I also kind of wanted to put out there is that I don't know if there are other people who are looking to partner or to 
somehow collaborate on a deeper level. Um, I'm not necessarily interested in hiring anybody, but Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's ways to share resources either through co-ownership or partnership or something, but I would be open to talking to people about that. And I think I've even put it in the forums before. So, because it is tough doing this all just by yourself. And I don't feel like I'm by myself because I have X, Y, I have, a wide circle of uh, peers mm-hmm. all over, lots of different kinds of support here and there. Very, very important though. Very, very. Yeah. I appreciate you bringing that partnership conversation up. It was, it was something that a few years ago, we all kind of um, started to suspect may be the future for a lot of firms is that they actually end up partnering and and merging together. And I know I've uh, cited this podcast a number of times since we've recorded, but the Michelle Smallenberger and and the Financial Design Studio podcast was uh, where she and three other members, uh, two other members, and then her husband all merged their firms together because it was just a meeting of the minds. Right. And I knew one of the guys and he was in one of my marketing study groups, you know, so it was great. Yeah. And, and the, the idea that, you know, we could leverage each other's specialties and, mm-hmm. and quite frankly, passions, because <laughs> mm-hmm. there's a lot to running a business that we don't all have to love. And, and yeah. we definitely probably won't all love. Um, but this idea that there's some collaboration and, and partnering up. So um, mm-hmm. Angie, I'm glad you put that out there. And, and listeners, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to Angie. Mm-hmm. Um, she did mention a couple things uh, that there was a there was a beta mentorship program that we did at XYPN about a year and a half ago, nearly two years ago. And they mm-hmm. worked together for six months or so. We do not have a full-fledged uh, mentorship program here at XY, but there's a lot of peer mentorship and organic mentorship that kind of comes up through that. Um, but I'm wondering about your business coach. What, what I, I, I hear in your voice and I can sense it that you are very coachable. Um, but what is it about the business coach that's, that's so helpful to you? And, and why did you find that, that investing in a business coach was, was worth it to you? So this, this is the most recent one or Brewer? What, uh, one let's talk the most recent one. Okay. So she's just, um, you know, her own story is very compelling. She was in like drama on Broadway or something. She worked, she was a secretary. She wasn't a, um, actor, but she just has this very outgoing personality, just a sales oriented personality. And she just decided she wanted to pursue her own business. And I think it kind of started as consulting or something like that. And it evolved and, you know, she now has this a $7 million practice and she's just helping other people get that fire. Cause that's something too. I feel like I, I have fire. I just don't always pull it out. And find that fire, get fired up, know, you know, who you're doing things for, what's your message, how are you doing it, and to be actively working at it every day. And to, and she's tough. You know, that's the other thing is she's not, Mm -hmm. she's not interested in hearing your but, buts, you know, or uh, I did this sort of, you know, she wants to have some results. And so she's very, very um, honest in a, in a good way. You know, she's not mean or anything like that, but Mm -hmm. It's just sometimes what you need to hear, just like what we do with our clients is, is really how it relates. And so it's that tough love, but it's, it's very numbers driven. You know, if, you, if you're going to be wanting a hundred clients, then you need to do this, 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 and this, this frequently. And, wow. you know, the numbers game kind of thing. So again, it's just the same message, but different voice, different mm-hmm. approach, that kind of thing. And I find that uh, the motivation is also very important, just getting that, that daily, weekly jolt is very yeah. helpful. And I really admire you to have kind of done a lot of um, practicing a lot of self-awareness about where, where your strengths and weaknesses are as, as you went through this and deciding earlier than I think a lot of folks do that a coach is what you need. And, mm-hmm. and I think us that are coachable kind of crave that all, mm-hmm. all of our lives. Um, what is her name and, and what is your relationship? Um, did you meet with her monthly or weekly or how long do you plan on engaging her? Yeah, so I've I've signed up for a year and her name is Suzanne Evans and her company is Driven Inc. Okay. And I want to say she's out of Charlotte, North awesome. Carolina. And I just um you know, there's there's a there's group coaching, there's group calls, there's mm. Facebook lives, there's individual coaching calls as well. So I'm just starting basically. Yeah. This is my really my first month. Um but I just, I like the business focus. She's focusing yeah. on building 
the business, the numbers, the money, the business, you know, getting that really going, not just a little bit, you know, she wants big outcomes. So it's nice to hear that because I, I, I'm kind of that person, I think too, who I don't, it's a, I wouldn't say I necessarily have big goals. I have small goals, but she's trying to get me to think bigger than I mm. want to. And I, I think that's good because I can probably do better. I can do more than what I'm actually telling myself. So um, I think it'll be very, very helpful over time. Yeah. And like you said earlier in the, in the recording that, you know, you haven't felt like you've reached your, your potential impact. Mm-mm. That is so cool. Yeah. And I love thinking about that. I also really admire you, Angie, because you've, you've been around the XYPN community a lot and, and you've really leaned in since you joined. Um, and, and that means you've, you've shown up to, to the in-person events. You've, you've shown up in the forums. You've really um, tapped the potential of the network. And I'm wondering, how have you done that just generally uh, throughout these years? And then why was it so important for you um, to, to find value there? Well, you know, it's a resource. And if you sit back and don't use it, it's of no value. And so I, I really like connecting with like-minded people. You know, we all have this very similar approach to what we think financial planning and money management should look like. And it's just when you're, I, I don't have that here in my mm. local area. I mean, I, I don't even have like an FPA group here in town. I don't have a NAFA group in town. I have an estate planning council group which is a wide variety of professionals that I just joined this last year. But I don't have even a small version of any NAFA, nothing like X, Y. So um, you are my lifeline. (laughs) All you people are my lifeline. I love the podcast. I mean, I probably listen to 90% of those as well. Um, Kids just came to Spokane a couple of years ago. So I went to Spokane to, you know, make sure I heard what he had to say. And I felt special because I was like the only one there who was X, Y, you know. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. And so there's just just so many resources and it does make you feel less alone. And I have, mm-hmm. you know, I have my study group that has shifted a little bit. We have people come, people go. Yeah. But, but just having that constant support is so important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's such good advice, knowing especially how open we've been about it on the podcast over the years, just how hard the first few years are. And by the time you're in year six and seven, it's still hard. It's just a different heart. And yeah. it's, you're, you're dealing with different challenges, but that's that's the world of the entrepreneur. Um, Angie, I'm interested in, in where you hope to bring this. Uh, do you feel like you have a client number in mind? Do you feel like you have a definition for that impact that you want to have? What's, what's your future going to hold for you? I do. I again, my goals are kind of small. Again, I'm I'm mid-century modern, so I have I, in my mind maybe a 20-year career ahead of me and I want to build it to about under 50 clients, under 50 ideal ongoing clients I would describe that. And um I just I just hope to continue to attract who I'm attracting, which is these women who are nearing or in retirement and are ready to take charge of their financial lives. Maybe they're married, maybe they're not, you know, it doesn't matter either way, but um, that's kind of the size of the practice. Um, I also do something that are pretty fun, kind of unique women's circles. And it's just a fun thing in the evening, four times a year. And the idea is that, again, this is something I learned. I was trained by Elizabeth Jeton and Mm -hmm. Eleanor Blaney. And this goes back to 2014 when they came out to the West Coast and did a training on circles then. But I've been doing them off and on since then. And I'm trying to kind of do more and do bigger. Just just this year, it has already, I just had one on Monday, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I had uh, about seven, I think, seven of us. And I like to keep them under 12, so they'll never get super big. But I think that's another way to impact at a very low level, very personal level, because we meet, you know, we're, we're just sitting around a table in a circle Mm. and, um, continue to do those. Those are fun things to do. Continue to do my podcast. Um, my podcast was really focused on the college stuff early on. So now I have to, you know, start to adapt that and talk to different, mostly women professionals who are of that, um, Hanford site, I would say. And, you know, 
learn more about what are their pain points, learn more um, what's going on with them, you know, what it, what is going well, what's not going well. So those are, those are still things that I like to do and I plan to continue to do soon. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm interested in those women's circles. Is yeah. that, is that like a study group? Or are they the same women or what's the Mm-mm. format? <clears throat> no, it's actually just open to the public and I mm. post them on social media and um, I've had them as small as three, like me and two other people. Yeah. And I've had them, you know, as many as like 10 or 11. And so I like to keep them under 12. It's just a little bit too big once it gets beyond 12. Mm-hmm. But no, it's the, uh, the concept is just starting the conversation around money, just trying to get women yeah. to talk about money. Um, sometimes it goes off into investments and portfolios and what, and terms, you know, language, what's an IRA, what's an ETF, what's a, what's an asset class, things like that. Um, there's no teacher. It is a, it's a circle for a reason. It's a leaderless group. I call myself the host. I bring people oh. together, but it's really dependent on the people in the circle as to a, what gets talked about, who does the talking. Um, you're supposed to actually use a talking stick and I have a little mm-hmm. green toy, soft toy ball that you can throw around. You know, I relax the rules if the conversation seems to be going. It's just not, you're not supposed to talk one-on-one to the person to your side and ignore the people across the table. It's not that kind of thing. So it is a group discussion. Um, I have done things where I've put a theme. So I came ready on Monday to talk about market volatility and coronavirus, (laughs) and nobody was really interested in that. So I'm like, okay. (laughs) I don't need my questions. We'll we'll talk about what they wanted to talk about. Yeah. And and they, you know, they needed to learn about resources like how to learn more of this stuff. So we yeah. talked about morningstar.com or Vanguard or Fidelity or you know, where can you go for consumer information? So uh it's a great concept. And Eleanor and Elizabeth have kind of clued a few of us into that. So oh, yeah, I love I think, that. I think DFA is doing some women's circle training as well. Cool. Oh, I'd love to look more into that. Um, And as you talked about that, that reminds me a lot of, we had uh, Hillel Katsif on the podcast a couple months ago when he talked about his little blue box and and how it has a talking talking shell in it and he passes it around between families and it's to help the family begin to have that conversation. So I I give you so much credit for for hosting your own women's circles because going back to what you said earlier, sometimes women aren't aren't dialed into to the, the financial side of, of their lives. And I think that that's how we can help elevate uh, as advisors, male or female, to be able right. to help anyone who hasn't dialed in to dial in. Yeah. Um, if you can believe it, we are approaching our last few minutes. And okay. I'm wondering, Angie, if you had the opportunity to give your young business owner self, whether it be at the beer store or your first <laughs> RIA, uh, what advice would you give her? Oh, that overhead. Don't pick that store. <laughs> that store <laughs> is too big. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that store is too much square footage. You don't need that store. And don't buy that brand new walk-in co- cooler, which was very shiny and pretty and, and uh, didn't need that either. <laughs> so. Oh man, I have an appointment to get one later today. <laughs> oh, it was the, the shining. It was like the, the bright, shiny thing in our store. It was beautiful. Men just like flocked to it. They really did. <laughs> Uh, so, oh, oh my, okay. my, my other advice though, Maddie was, you know, open a beer store, get a husband. It really did work. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 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 So my, fun. my, my second husband and I reconnected there. So. <gasps> That's right. You found your husband. <laughs> but we, go. we met in kindergarten, so we knew each other before that. Oh, how sweet. Yeah. Well, Angie, I've so enjoyed chatting with you today. I I think we've had a lot of fun and I think our listeners uh, can take a lot from your story and your perspective. And and thank you for being so open and honest Mm -hmm. about what you've built and the hard parts and the great parts. Thank you, Angie. Oh, well, thank you. It was a great fun to talk to you and I look forward to all the future podcasts too with you. Yay. (laughs) Awesome. Avocado toast, selfies, a mountain of student loan debt. Gen Y is anything but traditional, and with over 75 million people, it's a population you don't want to ignore. Learn more about how to serve this unique population in our guide called Attract and Profitably Serve Millennial Clients in Your RIA. Discover three key ways to tap into the millennial market and six things that they want from their financial advisor. Visit xyplanningnetwork.com millennials for your free copy.
Be sure to join our VIP community at xyplanningnetwork.com slash VIP to hang out with other XYPN radio listeners, ask questions for future mailbag episodes, and finally, to find a community of like-minded financial advisors. Thank you so much for joining me today. We'll see you next time. You are not alone and you are not crazy. It's scary starting, building, and growing your own financial planning firm. And that's why we put together a free private community just for you, the cutting edge financial planner. Go to xyplanningnetwork.com forward slash VIP or text XYPN radio to 33344 and join a network of thousands ready to change the lives of Gen X and Gen Y clients.